My name is Pax Haymeyer. I'm the Director of Credit Bearing Programs here at the Stanford Center for Professional Development. And it is my pleasure today to host Alex Stamos uh, from the Stanford Internet uh, Observatory. He will be talking a little bit today about engineering a safe, safer internet, or more fundamentally, what is trust and safety engineering? Alex Stamos is a cybersecurity expert, a business leader, and entrepreneur working to improve the security and safety of the internet through his teaching and research at Stanford University. He's the director of the Stanford Internet Observatory at the Cyber Policy Center, a part of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, where he's also a research scholar. In addition to his work as a scholar and a researcher, Alex is also a practitioner, and prior to joining Stanford, he served in a variety of senior roles, uh, including as the chief security officer of Facebook, uh, probably a job no one, uh, no, no one envies him having, as well as the chief information sec uh, security officer at Yahoo. So he's bringing a, a combination, a really unique combination of the, the research and scholarship, as well as, as a practitioner who's actually been in the trenches and, and done a lot of this work. So Alex, with that, I'm just gonna hand it off to you. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about trust and safety engineering and focusing on a class that you teach here at Stanford that is open to remote students as well as on campus students. And so we might as well get started with, with the, the title of this class, which is, what is trust and safety engineering? Thanks, Pax. Uh, really excited to be able to offer Computer Science 152 Trust and Safety Engineering uh, to students who are, who are not able to come to the Stanford campus. Um, and this is going to be an exciting hybrid class uh, for both students on campus and off, uh, and ability for working professionals to, to learn about this space um, and to collaborate with current Stanford computer science students. Um, but that's a great question. What is trust and safety? So trust and safety is a little bit of a industry term for the way studying how people abuse the internet to cause harm. Right. So the term comes from the tech industry starting about maybe 20 years ago. It started to become in vogue, especially with payment companies, auction sites and such. Um, and is now a much broader set of looking at all the different ways people can use these online services to cause harm. Usually when you talk about trust and safety issues, you're talking about people using products the way they are designed to work. So this is what distinguishes trust and safety from information security or cybersecurity. When you talk about security, you're talking about people trying to manipulate a system to make it misbehave, to break it, right? You, you hack a system, you break a system. When you talk about trust and safety, people are using these products in a technically correct manner, but the outcome of what they are doing means a human being gets harmed. Um, and so it, it is a, quite a different field and a much more interdisciplinary field than information security, which is much more about computer science. And so while this is a computer science course and students get computer science credit from the Stanford CS department, uh, we are approaching it from much more of a cross-disciplinary than some of the other CS classes. Uh, it part of the reason why is there are te important technical components here. We'll talk about how machine learning works. We'll talk about how to abuse machine and use machine learning systems. Um, we'll talk about cryptography uh, and how cryptography can protect uh, users. We'll talk about a variety of different technical components, um, and there will be a technical project. But to really do this work, you have to have the technical skills, uh, but you also have to have an understanding of society and humanity that is broader than most uh, areas of computer science. Um, and one of the things that's really fascinating about trust and safety that is a lot like InfoSec is it's dynamic and unpredictable. This is a situation in which you're dealing with adversaries. Uh, and this is one of the reasons I find both security and trust and safety to be really intellectually interested. Because in other fields of engineering, your adversary are the laws of nature and physics. It is thinking about, if, you wanna, if you're a civil engineer and you're building a bridge, you're fighting against corrosion and gravity and material science issues. You're, and and th this is an area where things just kind of get better and better and better as we have a better understanding of the physical world and the way that engineers can build systems that live within those rules. Trust and safety is not like building a bridge. It's more like playing chess. You never f are done becoming a great chess player. And you can't become a good chess player just by reading books about it. You have to practice. Um, and that's one of the things that keeps this a very interesting field is whatever you do in it, just like with security, people will turn around and react and you have to get up the next day. You can have a great day, a Tuesday, you go to bed, I did a really good thing, I kicked a bunch of bad guys off the internet or I got some bad guys arrested and Wednesday morning they're doing something totally different. 
Um, and that can be discouraging for some people, but I think it also makes it a very dynamic field to be in an interesting field. Uh, the other reason I think this is a really important area is uh, most of the harm that actually accrues to people online is not due to hacking or infosec vulnerabilities. It is due to abuse. Again, the, the technically correct use of these products to cause harm. Um, infosec is really only the tip of the pyramid of the bad things that happen. For, for every kind of high-end hacking attack that you hear about, there are hundreds or thousands of examples of people being harassed until they're offline, of people having their photos stolen, um, intimate photos and distributed online, of children being sexually abused um, online. That happens at a much larger scale than the, the technical stuff we talk about. And even if you dive into the security field, into InfoSec, what you'll find is the things that are really hurting people are the much more prosaic human problems, such as the account lifecycle or the difficulty of, of patching in large organizations. And so one of the things we talk about in this class is the fact that we spend a huge amount of time thinking about the tip tip of this pyramid of the really sexy new vulnerabilities and, and new flaws. And we don't spend enough time in computer science thinking about the things that happen every day where people make mistakes with their passwords, where they reuse passwords, where they get their phone number stolen, that actually in some cases has much more impact. One of the things we also talk about in this class is the biggest challenges that's facing this field. The, by far the biggest is scale. When you talk about very large platforms, you're talking about companies that have something like 50, 60,000 people, uh, but they're serving 2 billion, 3 billion users, right? So if you're talking about like the YouTube scale, the meta scale, um, soon the TikTok scale, you're talking about billions of users. Um, and so figuring out engineering techniques that allow a relatively small number of people to keep a large number of people safe is one of the key issues here. Uh, another issue is that we traditionally have not had a diverse set of people in this field. A lot of people that move into trust and safety come from the places where these companies are headquarters, like California or the United States overall. But when you talk about 3 billion users, obviously the vast, vast majority of them are not American, are not English speaking. And the kinds of issues they face sometimes are quite different. Um, and that's one of our goals with the class and in the field overall is to try to diversify the set of people that work in it so that we can have more diverse studies of abuse and more diverse solutions. There's a lot of measurement and definitional challenges we talk about. What is hate speech? is something that you can spend years thinking about and trying to kind of philosophically define. Um, and yet you don't have years to do that. If you go and work on one of these companies, you have to come up with a definition and then you have to be able to measure against that definition. Uh, there's a constant privacy versus safety trade-off that this industry is dealing with at the same time that we're trying to improve the privacy of users. In doing so, we sometimes make it harder to keep them safe and coming up with technological solutions that allow you to keep it safe without gathering a huge amount of data about them is one of our big challenges. There's lots of issues between information sharing between organizations, as well as the division of responsibility with the government. And that's one of the constant challenges we're dealing with. We'll talk a lot about this in the class is when you're doing things like stopping terrorists or stopping child molesters, that feels like a job the cops should be doing, right? That feels like, hey, the, don't we have people that we pay for to enforce the laws? But as we'll talk about in the class, it's actually extremely complicated to, and, and effectively impossible for, for law enforcement to do this themselves. You, know, you have to help your users directly um, and then work with law enforcement in a way that is respectful of privacy and the law, but also respectful of the safety needs of your users. Um, and finally, one of the interesting emerging issues here is kind of the fairness and the solutions, because one of the big uh, things we do to solve the scale issue is the use of machine learning. And machine learning has caused all kinds of interesting issues. And we'll talk about a bunch of those in the class. Thanks, Alex. That's uh, that's really interesting. And I think it's a nice, especially number two there, is a nice segue into kind of the next question that I'd have. I do do want to comment. We might have already lost a lot of people. It's, these challenges are big challenges. Um, yeah. And I can, you know, I, I, whenever I read about these, I think especially about just five and six is just that the complexity of working within an organization, working across jurisdictions, working within a jurisdiction uh, in terms of different governments. But in terms of building, you know, the, the diversity of the group, I mean, who are the people that that who might be interested in taking this course? Who are the people who would be served well by this course? And what are the jobs that people who do this are, are already filling? Can you kind of give us an example of the players and the scope of, of what's happening here? 
Yeah, that's a great question, Pax. Um, so one of the great things about trust and safety is it does attract people from a variety of different disciplines, and you need all of those people to be firing on all cylinders if you want to do a good job. Uh, you have research teams. So you have people who sometimes come from social science backgrounds, sociology backgrounds, social work backgrounds, um, or they come from like data science backgrounds, whose job it is to think about what are the abuse types, how do we measure them, Sometimes they do field studies, so they'll interview users, they'll interview victims of different kinds of uh, abuses, and they'll come up with ideas of how do we protect them. Uh, then you have product and engineering teams. Uh, so the people who build the product in the end are going to have to be responsible for designing good user experiences, building detection mechanisms, building features into the system that keep people safe, um, and then building the mechanisms on the back end that help you find and stop abuse, such as the machine learning systems um, and kind of the, the things like content moderation pipelines and such. You have people in operations. So this is actually a pretty broad field of folks who um, come to this field from who often come to trust and safety from a different area. They work in customer service and customer support, and they're really interested in the safety component. Um, and there's this is where there's thousands and thousands of open jobs in industry right now, um, is the people who take the policies that come from high above and then figure out how do these actually apply to normal people, uh, build the pipelines, and then sort through billions and billions of events or uh, items of content to try to decide how it works and then build kind of a self-improvement process to, to fix these things. Um, and then for the absolute worst cases, you, you have investigators. Um, so uh, people whose job it is to investigate the worst bad guys, the worst kind of abuses, and then work with that with law enforcement, either because law enforcement has come to the company or because you're proactively going out to refer uh, the worst cases. Um, and they have a really important job of understanding like what is the worst kind of things that are happening on our platform right now. So this is especially true for areas like fraud where you really need deep investigations because fraudsters and spams uh, and spam senders are really professional organizations. And so mapping out those orgs so you can take care of them and then work with law enforcement to perhaps bring some legal pressure is important, as well as areas like counterterrorism and child safety, uh, where the behavior of those people online is something that you can't allow at all. Um, and you're dealing with professional groups um, that you need to uh, sometimes uh, counteract. Uh, and in one investigation, you can sometimes have a positive impact on hundreds or thousands of victims of that one organization. That's great. Um, can you, you know, it's, it's great to hear that you can have that big an impact. I mean, I think that's one of the benefits maybe of working in, in this area. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit is so obviously at a larger organization, these may be, there may be a specific product in engineering that is focused on trust and safety, but I imagine right. this class could be valuable if you're at a startup, if you're where you're not going to have this big a, an engineering group, if you're, if you're maybe you're not in trust and safety, you're not information security, but you're just a product manager or you're just someone who runs customer service, would you still get value? I mean, out of this class, is this still something that you want to be thinking about? Yeah, absolutely. And and that's a big goal of the class is to, you know, we have, we'll have about 180 students or so take the class in person. And I expect out of them, based upon our previous groups, four or five of them will go into full-time trust and safety roles. And that's great because part of our goal is to just, I, I think those five per year would never have considered these roles otherwise. The other 175 are going to be product managers and engineers and data scientists um, doing other kinds of things, but there's very few products you can work on where there's not some kind of safety aspect, right? Um, and so, yes, I totally agree that what we part of what we want to do is for is to help educate people who want to do this as a career, but also anybody who's building these products, it's important for them to have the skill set. That's especially true for startups because realistically, a 12-person startup is not going to have a trust and safety team but they will have a product manager. And if that product manager has in the back of their head, ooh, these are the safety issues I learned about in that Stanford class, then maybe you won't make those mistakes up front that make it so critical to have a trust and safety team later. Maybe you can kind of head a bunch of those things off in the past. Maybe that's a good segue just kind of in the next part of what we, we want to talk about is just the class structure. And I, I know this changes a little bit from year to year. So if you could give us an example of how do you approach teaching <laughs> this very difficult topic, what does the structure of the class actually look like? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, this is an example structure. Again, we do update it year to year. This is our, our, our current one. As you can see, we have some TBDs in here that we're, we're still working on. Um, general, what we do is we have two lectures a week. Each lecture is 80 minutes. Um, that will be in person for uh, 
uh, on campus students, and then we'll provide a uh, video via the SCPD platform um, asynchronously so SCPD students can experience it asynchronously uh, uh, on their own time. Um, we'll have a combination of lectures that are broad. So as you see here, we have a lecture on how do tech companies work, how do you design for trust and safety, right? So that's kind of an introduction to where does trust and safety fit into organizations and what are the different pieces. Um, we'll have a, a broad discussion um, of emerging issues, for example. But the core of the class is looking at specific domains of abuse, understanding the historical aspects here. What are some of the problems that have been faced in this area in the past? And what are some technical and operational and policy solutions that companies consider in the future? So our goal is not just to say the world's terrible and make everybody nihilistic and sad. Our goal is to, okay, things are tough in this area, but it turns out in all of these areas, there are things you can do to address the, the possible problems. Um, and so we talk about those solutions and what might be useful in different areas. So, you know, for example, um, when we talk about, uh, you know, child uh, sexual exploitation, we kind of talk about this is the space, this is how the bad things have happened. And then we talk about kind of the positive side. This is the ecosystem that has grown up to deal with this. These are the kind of resources that are available to companies. And these are solutions that have been put in place that have demonstrated real benefits for children who use these products and the ability to keep uh, bad guys off. Um, uh, so, you know, it's both a historical look and then we have several uh, lectures that really look forward, um, especially like uh, how are blockchains and Web3 technologies being abused um, and uh, how is end-to-end -end encryption changing the trust and safety field? Uh, so, you know, a lot of review of the past, and then we talk a bit about these are the areas that you have to think about in the future. Uh, so the structure of the class is uh, during the week, we'll have those two lectures. There'll be a discussion section, um, and we'll have two different options for SCPD students to call in uh, via Zoom to participate in the discussion sections. Um, discussion sections are optional. Uh, this is, like I said before, you get good at doing this stuff by actually practicing it. So we don't want this to be a test-based class. This is not a class where you get homework every week and you have to do problem sets um, and uh, then take a big final. What we want to do is to give people the real experience of students of giving them the real experience of dealing with these issues. So 30% of the class is based upon quizzes that happen before each of those lectures based upon the pre-reads. So for each class, we'll have two or three articles that we ask students to read, and then we have a pretty easy quiz. The quiz is just to make sure that students, and this is probably less the SCPD students and more of our in-person uh, Stanford students, um, to make sure they're, they do the pre-reads before the lecture starts. Um, and so my goal is for everybody to get 100% of that on those uh, if they're just doing the pre-reads. Um, but then the vast majority of the grades, 70% of it comes from a final project. And so the final project teams, uh, last year, uh, the ratio here is we had three or four computer science students, and then we had one political science student uh, who was taking a sister class that is taught by Dr. Shelby Grossman in the political science department. And those four to five students work together on this final project where they, they decide on a very specific type of abuse on a specific platform. They study it deeply, and then they come up with a technical and a policy, a set of policy solutions to deal with it. Um, so uh, at the end of this, the way this is uh, implemented is implemented as a, a bot on Discord. So we have a, a, a class Discord server, and every group has its own two channels. And one of those channels is as if it's the platform, and the other channel is the control channel. And you build a bot. We give you a framework that allows you to interact with Discord, um, and your team builds a bot that looks for different kinds of abuse and then reports, this is what I've detected and, and takes certain steps. So uh, the other thing you do is you put together a poster to present this. And then at the end of the year, uh, we don't have the exact timing yet, that will be announced. Um, but at the end of the year, there is a uh, three hour poster session where the team stand in front of their poster uh, and we have guest judges. So last year we had about 25 guest judges from industry. So these are people who work at Google and Meta and Discord and Twitch. Um, and a variety of other Apple, a variety of other big companies who work on trust and safety. And those real practitioners walk around, they talk to each team, they, they, they listen to the presentation, they look at their demo. So the students generally have a laptop there to do a quick demo of their product. Um, and they help give feedback and to grade it. And then uh, one of the interesting things is the number of people get jobs that way too, as you can imagine. It's a, a pretty good way to, to interview for a job. Uh, for the SCPD students, they'll have the option if if they happen to have the ability to come to Stanford, they're welcome to join us on campus. Um, otherwise, we will be mixing the SCPD students in with the different student groups um, so they can be a talking head on a laptop to participate uh, in that process remotely if they're not able to make it to campus.
this. Uh, here's an example of one of the posters from last year where they specifically were studying cryptocurrency fraud on Twitter um, and built an entire normalization and machine learning framework to look for different kinds of frauds specifically around cryptocurrency and, and had a lot of success in doing so. That's really interesting. So in terms of the students taking this class, this class, the, the trust and safety engineering, there is an expectation that you have some basic programming background that you're able to, to, to write something that can interact with the Discord API. So on Stanford, we'd say that's at least through CS106B. So it's kind of a year of, of uh, about a year or two quarters of, of programming experience. Is right. that a, a fair? Right, yeah, we do expect students to have basic programming experience. You should not take this class if you're just learning a programming language for the first time. It's not, you know, different students have different levels. So we have all the way up to, you know, fourth year PhD students who are super technical and deep into AI. We have students who have only taken, who are freshmen or sophomores who have only taken the first couple of quarters. Um, so we do have mixes of groups. Uh, and we try to mix up the groups by skill level so that people can find different things. And there's a lot of work here other than just programming. But we do expect everybody who takes the computer science side to be able to participate in the creation of the of the programming. Um, but there's a lot of parts in that. Uh, and it varies uh, whether or not you're building like a complex machine learning or you're building, say, the interactive component of the bot or the, the reporting structure. There's different there's different levels here. But yes, we, we expect to have uh, basic programming knowledge. Usually Python is almost always the language in which the students choose to write the code in. We, we leave it open to them, but we provide the API in P Python. And most of the open documentation on how to do the Discord API is in Python. So it is by far the easiest language for most teams to choose. Yeah, that makes sense. And that that actually, uh, that, that that sounds good. There's maybe even opportunity if you're a beginning programmer, advanced programmer, to, to, to if you're advanced, getting that that experience of coaching someone through who's still learning learning the nuts and bolts. If you're new, is getting that experience to maybe be coached by another student uh, yeah. who, who's who's more advanced. Um, yeah, and we often have students who bring like these incredible backgrounds, right? We'll have a PhD student who's in who's in computer vision, and so they right. build a computer vision nudity detection system from scratch, right? Like <laughs> that is not the expectation. You know, right. we try to normalize the grading uh, of these classes, and you know, this is not. We're not looking to flunk anybody. We're trying to, we, we have grades to get people to do, but there's no curve here. Everybody can get an A if everybody kind of fulfills uh, the requirements of the course. You know, usually we have a distribution of, of A's and B's and nobody gets below B unless their team completely, you know, they don't show up uh, or their team completely did, you know, missed, missed uh, uh, you know, the, the outline of what they're supposed to do. Um, that's extremely rare. Yeah, you can scope the project to your skill levels. And it does sound like there's right. an opportunity for, for SEPD, for any student who's a, a working professional who's maybe at one of these companies, already has the job, to be able to bring, you know, to, to, to be able to bring their professional experience. You know, as you said, one of your early lectures is how does a tech company work? Well, you're going to know how the tech company works because that's, right. that's what you're doing right now. And you can bring that experience and that knowledge to the project as well. Um, yeah, no, that would be great. And we have a number of students uh, who take the class who are re-entry students or doing a master's degree who have industry experience. And that is a great thing that I hope to get from SCPD students is, is the same kind of real industry experience. Because like you said, these 19 year olds, they're very smart, but they've never had the realistic, you know, had to work on a realistic project that has to ship on time and have constraints. Um, and that's part of what we're trying to simulate here by having it be a multidisciplinary project, by having as part of the project that you have to simulate failures and think about how your system fails. Um, it's a little bit different kind of a standard computer science problem set based uh, project. That's great. Can we dig a little bit deeper then into the, the learning goals of the class and what, what students will get out of it or what you hope students will get out of it by the end of the course? Sure. Um, so the first learning goal is by the end of this class, we expect that any of our students should be able to explain to fellow software engineers and product managers the common ways the internet technologies are used to cause harm. It's 10 weeks. We're not expecting them to be the world expert in trust and safety. But if one of our alumni is in an engineering team and they say, hey, let's build an app where you can send photos anonymously to whoever you want on the internet, they can talk about, oh, these are three or four things that have happened in the past that isn't so good. And so we should think about when we build this product, the kinds of things that are likely to happen. Uh, the second is, as they work on these issues, that they understand how a lot of these problems are really long existing societal challenges. Uh, you know, hate speech was not invented by the internet. Discrimination was not invented by the internet. Unfortunately, child abuse was not invented by the internet. These are all things that have existed for thousands of years. But 
the existence of modern communication technologies where people can interact across the globe for no cost and possibly speak to millions of people at once definitely changes how the societal challenges are reflected. Uh, and so a big part of our goal is to not just say, okay, well, this is how hate speech happens, but have kind of an understanding of how we got there and what are the, the legal and societal guidelines that have existed in the past that now need to be adopted to this new world. Um, the third is to just anticipate safety risks for a proposed project product. So if somebody came to you with like, here's a product that you would come up with like the basic risks for that. Um, and practically, uh, we build, we expect them to be able at the end of this to design and implement a functional abuse reporting flow uh, powered by a basic classifier. This is not an AI class, so we're not going to go deep into how classifiers work and such. But the expectation here is that any of these teams have the ability to take a framework that's provided to them um, and build a, a functional abuse reporting flow uh, that uses some kind of intelligence behind it. And, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to build empathy for the people who actually get harmed um, when products get built. This is a screenshot of a, a young woman named Amanda Todd um, who, who famously took her own life after being bullied online. Um, her death in the the work her parents have done since she passed away has really changed the way lots of tech companies have thought about safety. And one of the things we want to do here is for these students to be able to learn from these tragedies of the past, to have empathy for the people who use these products so that they don't have to learn the hard way through tragedy of what possibly can happen. Um, and understanding like this is what's happened before, these are the mistakes that were made so that you can perhaps make different and less uh, horrible mistakes in the future uh, when products are built. One thing we do have to talk about with this class is this class does deal with a lot of difficult content, right? So we will, we are going to have a lecture on hate speech, and we're going to talk about hate speech, and people will be exposed to bad words and slurs and the ways people have used hate speech in the past to abuse others. We're going to talk about sexual exploitation of both children and adults. We're going to talk about suicide and self-harm. And uh, both in the in-person class and the SCPD students, we, we recognize that different people are going to bring different personal histories to dealing with these issues. And for some people, some of these issues might just be too close to home for them to be able to deal with. And so the, the way we deal with this is, um, you know, our syllabus uh, will be published. Uh, it, 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 it's going to be linked from this video. You can see when we're going to have certain lectures. Um, and if you look at this topic, and you're like, oh, man, this is something that might be hard for me. You can consider skipping it. You consider trying trying it out in the video version, but then bailing out. Um, and and if you don't want to do the pre-reads or something, this is something where we just could have some flexibility. Students can reach out to me and say, hey, you know, this suicide topic, it's I, I had a tragedy in my family in the last year. It's too early for me to engage on this. I'd like to do something alternative, um, and we'll provide you, a, you know, an alternative reading on a totally different topic um, instead of having you do it. So, uh, you know, basically, what we want to say is one: this is a hard class, um, and people should not, you know, it is not a sunshine and rainbows class, as you can imagine, right? We're talking about really difficult things, uh, but we're not doing so to try to make people feel uncomfortable or to insult them or make them angry. We're doing so because the truth is, is to deal with these issues, you have to get your hands dirty and you have to understand what's actually going on. Um, and so people should take the class if they feel like they can do that um, and they're, uh, you know, they, they feel like they can engage with most of the topics. And if there's say one topic that that is out of bounds for you, then we will have that flexibility to make sure uh, that everybody can experience the rest of the class without that one topic discouraging them and they won't be punished from a grading perspective. Also, each team comes up with their their topic. And so for teams where they have people who have maybe faced some of these really difficult issues, those are sometimes the teams that will choose something like fraud or a Bitcoin scam or spam, um, which are the kinds of topics that aren't as uh, emotionally difficult for people to deal with. Um, so if anybody has any questions uh, about the class, uh, they can hit me up at stamos at stanford.edu. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to this quarter and to having the SCPD students be part of the experience. Thanks, Alex. That that was wonderful. I, I do want to just end. I know we ended on the very uh, the, the 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 seriousness of the class and the subject matter, but I do want to emphasize again, as you mentioned earlier, that there is doing this allows you potentially have a big impact in terms of making better products that are safer, that are that that pre the, the goal is to prevent this kind of abuse and harm from happening in the future. So, yeah, uh, absolutely, the, the, it has a 
the, the potential here is, is really big uh, in terms it's, of having a positive impact. It's a very rewarding career, right? Because you really, you know, there, there's people who spend their lives optimizing ad networks or building online games, and that's fine. But there's nothing quite like helping real people and knowing that there's real people who something bad was happening to them and, and you stopped it. That's a pretty rewarding feeling. And uh, and so for, for the folks who are in a position to do it, I, I do recommend it as an area they should study. And, and like you said before, it's also just something you should keep in mind if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, if you're gonna be a product manager at a startup, then be, you know, being the person on your team who has this background and can do this work is also makes you very, very valuable to them. Well, thank you again, Alex, for, for joining us today and talking about this. And we look forward to seeing some of you in the class. Thanks, Max.